Good afternoon. As a land-grant institution, we would first like to acknowledge the Garbilino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, that is, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. Um, it is the land where UCLA sits. My name is Nines Ponce, and I'm the director of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research and professor and Wasserman Endowed Chair in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Uneven Protection, Gaps in California's Tobacco Control Policy Coverage Leave Many Vulnerable. California has been at the forefront in adopting policies to decrease smoking and its harmful public health effects. In 1995, it was the first state in the country to ban indoor smoking in workplaces, including restaurants. Bars and gaming establishments were added in 1998. In April 2017, California increased the taxes on a pack of cigarettes by $2 to $2.87 per pack. Yet cigarette smoking remains the leading cause of preventable death and disease in California and in the US. Though California has made progress reducing cigarette smoking rates during the past three decades, progress across communities in the state has been uneven. Using data from the California Health Interview Survey, researchers with the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research undertook one of the first studies to examine the impact of state and local policies on smoking behaviors. What we found is that cities with strong regulations limiting tobacco have greater reductions in adult cigarette smoking rates than cities with weak regulations or those that don't have them. In examining who is most likely to benefit uh, from living in areas with strong regulations, what we found is troubling, though not surprising. The people who have been disproportionately harmed include racial, ethnic, and sexual minorities, low-income, rural, or multi-unit housing residents, and residents in neighborhoods with high concentrations of low-income populations or minoritized populations. Today, three of the study's co-authors Dr. Yu Yu, postdoctoral researcher at the center, Peggy Toy, former director of the health data program at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, and Evi Hernandez, senior director of programs at the California Health Collective, will share their research findings. I would like to thank the other researchers involved in this study, including my colleague, Dr. James Masinko, a faculty associate at the Center and Professor and Associate Dean for Research at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And of course, Dr. Ying Ying Meng, Director of Research at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, co-director of our chronic disease program, and the lead author and principal investigator of this important project. Unfortunately, Dr. Ying Ying Meng is unable to join us today, but I wanted to heartily thank her, thank her for her leadership for decades at the center on numerous research projects and evaluations of statewide programs related to smoking behaviors and disparities, and her work to reduce secondhand smoke exposure through smoke-free policies in low-income neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Next slide, oh, there you go. Uh, if you're interested in today's slides, you can request them from our communications department at healthpolicy.ucla.edu. Um, that, that uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Yu Yu. Thank you so much for introduction, Dr. Pansik. Hi, everyone. My name is Yu Yu, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Now, I will start with the study background. Um, currently, cigarette smoking still remains the leading cause of preventable deaths and disease in California and in the United States overall. As Dr. Ponzi mentioned before, California has been at the forefront in adopting policies 
in decreased smoking and its harmful public health effects. In 1995, it was the first state in the country to ban indoor smoking in workplaces, including restaurants. And also bars and gaming establishments were also added in 1998. Effective April 1st, 2017, the state substantially increased the cigarette tax from 87 cents to $2.87 per pack. However, even California as a whole has made a significant progress over the past three decades in reducing the rates of cigarette smoking. Progress across communities in the state still has been uneven. So this study aims to, st uh, to examine whether there are any inequities in tobacco control policy protection across adult populations and to examine the effects of these policies on smoking behaviors, especially in the reduction of tobacco-related disparities among priority populations. Here, we defined the priority populations as those disproportionately impacted by tobacco. For example, racial or ethnic or sexual minorities, low income, rural, or multi-unit housing residents, or those living in the neighborhoods with high concentrations of low income or minority residents. Specifically, we examined the following. First, the variations in local tobacco control policies in terms of protecting residents, especially priority populations, Second, the effects of state and the local policies on overall adult smoking behaviors by looking at the current cigarette smoking among adults. And third, the policies effects on smoking behaviors among priority populations. To fulfill the study aims, we used the 2014 to 2019 California Health Interview Survey, CHIRS data, and the linked with, first, the city level tobacco control grade, that is the state of tobacco control SOTC grade score from the American Lung Association, ALA, and second, linked with the neighborhood social economic status data from the California, from the car environmental screen from the Office of Environmental Health Hazard assessment. And we also use the data that we collected from our focus group and the key informant interviews. From chest data, we use the responses to certain questions to define cigarette smoking behaviors. The currently smoking are based on the chest question, that is, do you now smoke cigarettes every day, some days, or not at all? If the answers to every day or some days, then they were combined to define it as current smoking. Since 2013, the American Lung Association has assigned grades indicating the strength of local tobacco control policies in four key areas or categories. They are first, smoke-free outdoor air. Second, smoke-free housing. Third, tobacco retailer licensing requirements. And fourth, emerging issues. For 482 incorporated cities and all unincorporated areas in 57 counties, excluding San Francisco. Each city and county are given a point value based on the strength of its local ordinance. For example, the smoke-free outdoor air grade is based on the smoking restrictions adopted by the local communities in seven outdoor areas, including dining areas, entryways, public events, 
recreation areas, service areas, sidewalks in commercial areas, and walk sites. For the dining areas, a value of four is assigned if all outdoor dining areas at the bars and the restaurants are 100% smoke free. But a value of zero is given if there are no smoking restrictions in outdoor dining areas. These points are then added to calculate a total score, which is then converted into a ladder grade from A to F to better display the strength of different categories of the local tobacco control policies. The grades in smoke-free outdoor air, smoke-free housing, and tobacco retailer licensing, along with the emerging issues bonus points, are then used to calculate an overall tobacco control grade for each municipality. The current environmental screen, which is generated by the Office of Environmental Health has assessment, is a mapping tool that helps identify California communities that are most affected by many sources of pollution and where people are often especially vulnerable to these effects. It uses environmental health and social economic information to produce scores for every census tract in the state. The neighborhood social economic status data from the car environmental screen we used here are defined using the census tract level data, including educational attainment, linguist isolation, poverty, unemployment, and housing burden to low income households. Now, let's see what, we, what the findings are. First, local policy adoption varies in California. We found in 2014, 185 incorporated cities and 30 unincorporated areas were not covered by any local tobacco control policies. By 2019, the figure had declined further to 100 and 28 incorporated cities and 20 unincorporated areas. Although the number of policies adopted increases each year, many Californians still live in communities where these policies are absent or where the strength of such policies is still very low. Based on the ALA, overall tobacco control grade. More than 60% of the cities, that is three in five cities in the state, were assigned grades of D or F in 2019, representing weak or absent local tobacco policies. Specifically, 211 cities were graded as F and 83 cities graded as D while only 40 cities received an A, 53 cities received a B, and 95 cities received a C. We can also observe from the map that most cities in the Bay Area were covered by local tobacco control policies, graded as A or B, while cities in the Central Valley were mostly covered by the policies that were graded as D or F. So these differences across California's counties and cities have created a patchwork of the regulations. The second finding is that population groups, especially those in areas with low neighborhood social economic status are less likely to be protected by local policies. Looking at the percentage of populations unprotected by local tobacco control policies by neighborhood social economic status, NSES, we found that policy protection across priority populations 
it's unequal. For example, more than 17% of Black or African Americans and 25% of Latino adults living in the low neighborhood social economic status areas were unprotected by local tobacco control policies, compared with only 8.5% of Black or African American and 7.5% of Latino adults living in higher neighborhood social economic status areas. We can also see there are 20.8% of those who had family incomes of less than 400% federal poverty level and living in the areas with low neighborhood social economic status were not protected by local tobacco control policies compared with 9.9% of their counterparts that are living in higher neighborhood social economic status areas. And for those living in multi-unit housing in low neighborhood social economic status areas, there were 17.8% unprotected by local tobacco control policy, while only 9.8% were not protected by local tobacco control policies in high neighborhood social economic status areas. The third finding is that cities with strong local tobacco control policies have lower cigarette smoking rates. Overall, smoking rates were only 10.1% in the locations with a strong overall tobacco control policy grade, which is from A to C, in contrast to 11.5% in the locations with poor grades, that is graded as D or F. Looking at each specific local policies, the percentage of current smoking was 9.6% among residents in the cities with a smoke-free outdoor policy graded as A or B or C, but 11.6% in the areas with a policy grade of D or F. In the cities with a grade of D or F for smoke-free housing policy, about 11.2% of the residents reported currently smoking, but only 8.8% .8 reported among those in the cities with strong policy. For the tobacco retailer licensing policy, the percentage of current smoking was 10.4% among those living in the areas graded as A through C, versus 11.2% in the areas with the policy graded as D or F. What we found at number four is that state and the local tobacco control policies work in synergy to further decrease smoking rates. As we mentioned before, effective April 1st, 2017, the state raised the cigarette tax from 0.87 to $2.87 per pack. We found that before April 2017. Overall, 12.5% of the Californians reported the current cigarette smoking, where neither local nor state policy was in place. Smoking rates declined to 11.5%, where only local policy had been adopted. After April 2017, the state policy took effect. The smoking rate further decreased to 7.7% among those living in the areas where both state and local policies were in place, indicating that the adoption of both state and local policies could further accelerate the reductions in current smoking.
Similarly, for each local tobacco control policy, current smoking rates could be further reduced by about three percentage points where local policies are adopted given the existing state policy contest. From the table, you can see that the smoking rates were above 12% where neither state nor each specific local tobacco control policy was in place. Then it decreased to around 12% when only local policy was adopted and further decreased to about 9% when both state and the local policies were in place. Finding number five, beyond the reducing overall smoking rates, stronger local tobacco policies are also associated with decreased smoking rates among priority populations. Looking at the smoking rate by the strength of the overall tobacco control policy by race and or ethnicity. Among American Indian or Alaska Natives or adults of two or more races, the rate of currently smoking was 14.4%, where the overall tobacco policy was graded as A through C, but the rate was 19.3%, among those counterparts living in the areas with a policy grade of D or F. In the areas with policy grades of D, A or B or C, those who had family incomes of lower than 400% federal poverty level or living in the multi-unit housing or rural areas, or those are identified as a sexual minority, including gay, lesbian, homosexual, bisexual, had a rate of current smoking of 12.5%, 11.8%, 10.1%, and 14.2%, respectively. In contrast, the rates of current smoking among their counterparts in the areas with weaker local policies were 14.2%. 14.5%, 14.6%, and 17.3%, respectively. In summary, using the 2014 to 2019 Chess Adult data and existing state, county, and city tobacco control policies and neighborhood level data on social drivers of health, we observed that although California experienced a significant decline in cigarette smoking rates following the adoption of local and state tobacco control policies, there are still more than 60% of the cities in the state still had a weak or absent local tobacco control policy audience in 2019. Second, those living in the areas with low neighborhood social economic status were less likely to be protected by local tobacco control policies compared to those in higher neighborhood social economic status areas. Third, cities with strong local policies had lower smoking rates than those with weak or absent policies. And Current smoking rates could be further enhanced by the enactment of the state level tobacco policy. Beyond a positive association between more stringent local policies and the lower smoking rates, strong local policies were also associated with lower smoking rates among priority populations. Now I will pass to Peggy and Abby for the community opinions on local tobacco policies. Peggy. Thank you, Dr. Yu Yu. And we want, also wanted to examine the intersection of individual community and neighborhood factors and local policies on tobacco use 
and tobacco related disparities, especially among priority populations and those residing in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods. We wanted to know about community awareness and experience with tobacco policies, particularly community views on how and why local tobacco policies were adopted or not adopted, uh, the issue related uh, to implementation and enforcement of policies, as well as perceived benefits and barriers to policies in reducing smoking related disparities. We partnered with the California Health Collaborative to engage communities. Their team was involved in uh, conducting interviews and focus groups throughout California and were involved in the analysis of the data. For nearly 30 years, the California Health Collaborative has been a leader in tobacco control programs designed to reach areas and populations in high need. Evie Hernandez, California Health Collaborative Senior Director of Programs will discuss engaging communities in the study and other work and their other work on the project. Evie. Thank you, Peggy. And good afternoon, everybody. Very excited to be here and uh, very thankful for the opportunity for um, having been invited and being a part of the study. The California Health Collaborative is a statewide organization. We are dedicated to improving health outcomes for the underserved and the underrepresented populations in California. The organization was founded back in 1982 in California Central Valley, and since then um, has expanded its presence and reach through a myriad of different programs and services uh, being offered throughout the state. As part of this study, um, I believe that uh, we found uh, the benefit of having an organization such as ours being involved because of the connections, the networks, the reach that we have throughout the state. Um, and as a result of that, we ended up um, facilitating six focus groups um, that involved 48 participants and uh, 21 key informant interviews. The six focus groups were conducted in different areas or regions of California, and um, they were conducted virtually using the Zoom meeting platform. Um, and two of them were conducted in person. Um, it's important also to note that one of these focus groups was conducted with the uh, parent group, uh, and uh, it was in Spanish. Participants of the focus groups represented various, um, a, a diverse range of sectors in the community. Um, these were parents, young adults. Um, they were um, students, tobacco control professionals, public health administrators, volunteer organizations, and policymakers. Um, and they all had varying levels of experience associated with tobacco related policies and the impacts that these have in, in health disparities. In addition, we also conducted the 21 key informant interviews throughout the state. Um, and all of these were conducted using the Zoom platform. Participants in the key informant interviews uh, were members of the community, public health professionals, healthcare administrators, behavioral health professionals, um, those in academia and volunteer organizations. As you can see from the map here in this slide, um, we had a, a mission to represent or get as much representation from throughout the state. Um, it was important for us to get that commitment and to secure representation. Um, and it was a monumental task given the size of the state and um, all, all the, the varying uh, uh, issues, you know, that, that we had going on at the time, primarily the COVID pandemic. Um, as you are well aware, um, that really had an impact in the way that we conduct uh, or were conducting our work. And it was very difficult, especially at the beginning of uh, our recruitment process, to get people interested um, or to respond at all. Um, luckily, um, we are an established organization. Um, we have over 15 different tobacco-related projects, those working in tobacco prevention, tobacco cessation, um, research, and, and uh, also working with different community groups. So um, that really, that experience and that background really allowed for us to use those networks and be able to reach um, the various communities throughout the state. For the focus groups, uh, we had those taking place in uh, Los Angeles, um, in city of Colton, city of Madera, city of Oroville. We had one where, with representatives from the Bay Area and another one in the Central Coast. And uh, 
the key informant interviews, um, again, uh, these were done uh, by Zoom and it was recruitment using our various networks uh, from people uh, representing all these sectors of the community from throughout the state. Um, to hear more about the results of these um, interviews and focus groups, I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Toy, who's gonna give us more information about those outcomes. Thank you, Evie. So uh, one of the things that uh, we looked at are facilitators and barriers. So uh, in, uh, in uh, working with uh, the California Collaborative team and analyzing the data, here's some of the, our findings. Uh, in regards to tobacco policy adoption facilitators, the most effective facilitators was, the exist was mentioned as the existence of community coalitions. Uh, respondents said that coalitions were significant facilitators because they play a vital role in mediating the connection between those in positions of authority and the broader community, as, as well as uh, their ability to mobilize community residents and leaders to facilitate tobacco policy, uh, education and policy. Another facilitator uh, was the participation of diverse organizations. Uh, these include not only health, social, educational, and faith-based organizations, but also social justice advocacy organizations, environmental protection groups, neighborhood councils, business associations, and housing rights organizations and others. Another factor in uh, facilitating tobacco policy adoption is increased awareness through education and media. Uh, organizations working in the community facilitated uh, education through diverse strategies to educate the community. And this included utilizing community leaders or spokespersons, as well as media campaigns to disseminate messages and raise awareness within the culture and uh, the uh, language of the target audience. Youth involvement was perhaps the most frequently mentioned mo motivator of policy support. Uh, and that one of the reasons is that uh, there's a great desire in, within the community to protect youth from the harms of tobacco. The participation of young people also influences the acceptance of policies by empower, empowering those in the community to unite and prompti, prompting those in positions of authority to act. Next slide. So the other thing that uh, we learned is uh, the barriers uh, to policy support and adoption. One of the main barriers uh, that was mentioned by our respondents is that a pro-business uh, bias among stakeholders and uh, policymakers uh, uh, was a dominating influence to suppress the support of tobacco policies, uh, particularly in smaller and rural communities. Uh, where business bias is tied to economic stability concerns. Also frequently mentioned were, was the influence of uh, profit interests of the business sector and the tobacco industry influence as contrib contributing factors to impeding adoption of tobacco policies. The other main barrier that was most frequently mentioned are competing community priorities. Uh, during this time, COVID, uh, uh, early part of our study, COVID was dominant, but persistent barriers within many of these communities took priorities, uh, took priority over tobacco uh, control, combat, tobacco policy advocacy efforts. The other community level uh, issues that were mentioned are homelessness, substance abuse, mental health, and uh, crime prevention efforts. These were mentioned as higher priorities uh, over tobacco. Uh, lastly, some of our uh, informants uh, talked about the influence of uh, elected, of, uh, the tobacco industry uh, influence among elected officials. Next slide. So the other thing that we wanted to know is what was the awareness of policies that were in place and the adoption and enforcement of local tobacco uh, policies. So in terms of uh, uh, the policies most uh, identified or that respondents were aware of was outdoor recreation areas, uh, smoking restrictions, uh, tobacco retail licensing, uh, restricting the sale and marketing of tobacco products and retail outlets, 
outdoor dining, as well as smoke-free multi-unit housing. In terms of enforcement, uh, most respondents felt that uh, enforcement uh, is perceived as being limited, inconsistent, and ineffective with violations observed uh, among many of those uh, in uh, uh, discussing enforcement methods. Some of the methods they were uh, uh, familiar with is monitoring and complaint methods. That is monitoring compliance with the policy and then uh, uh, addressing uh, those to um, uh, local authorities or um, managers of let's say uh, housing units uh, to uh, register complaints. Uh, code enforcement was another, like housing code enforcement, including restrictions on smoking and ensuring compliance, and then fines and civil litigation. Uh, so fines were uh, uh, would be uh, adjudicated by the local jurisdiction. Civil litigation in many policies were someone suing, let's say, uh, a, a another resident in their multi-unit building, uh, and and suing that individual for smoking violations. None of these have been effective, particularly in the populations that we've been discussing, as high priorities uh, for exposure or uh, being unprotected by uh, tobacco policies. Next slide. Okay. So the, uh, our findings uh, from the study suggest uh, these recommendations. Uh, you know, affected communities and organizations who serve them are significant drivers of social and policy change at the local level. The California Department of Public Health, California Tobacco Prevention Program, has shifted from tobacco control to in-game strategies in which tobacco becomes less desirable, less acceptable, and less accessible, is driving efforts to address multiple contributions to tobacco-related disparities in California. From our findings, these recommendations uh, are put forward. Uh, one is support is needed to strengthen efforts to develop and adopt tobacco control policies. Support is needed uh, to ensure the ongoing continuity of such efforts. Uh, the other is that uh, we recommend that uh, communities need to uh, be if effectively informed, engaged, and empowered, especially among priority populations affected by the harms of tobacco use and lacking protection from tobacco policies. And finally, uh, the increase in public awareness of and capacity for implementing in-game strategy is needed to move these populations forward, uh, especially populations that are currently unprotected by tobacco policies uh, to implement in-game strategies. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Yu Yu to close out our presentations. Okay, here is our acknowledgement. Our first thanks give to our co-authors Dr. Ying Ying Meng, Dr. James Masinko, Dr. Nines Ponzi, and of course, our sponsors, uh, the Tobacco Related Disease Research Program, TRDRP, for funding these studies. Especially Dr. Maggie Kulik, our program officer for her always guidance and help. We also wish to thank Mina, Eli, Amber, Carissa, Chelsea, and Ricardo, for their amazing work in the qualitative data collection and analysis. We also want to thank our reviewers for their helpful comments. Dr. David Stoppelbein, Dr. Rebecca Williams, Dr. Sue Bobby, and Madding Sada. Our special thanks also goes to Chess Director Todd Hughes and his team for the collection of Chess data. We give special thanks to Yiqing, Andrew, Prani, Veronica, Zibri, and Julian for their statistical programming and data access support. We also wish to thank the American Learn Association, especially Erica and Nia, for providing us with the local tobacco control grade data. And of course, our thanks also definitely goes to the communications department, Tiffany, Tia, Mike, Yasmin, Melissa, and the last for assistance in producing and disseminating this policy brief.
Thank you everyone for joining us that day. And now we are going into the audience questions. Thank you so much, Yu Yu. Um, hello everyone, my name is Tiffany Lopeson. I'm the, sorry, the Director of Communications at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Um, I'll be going through the audience Q&A, so uh, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions. Um, were, this is a two-part question. So were specific tobacco policies found to be more correlated with reduced smoking rates than others? Also, how would you define strong tobacco policy? I think I can take this question. So, so first of all, strong tobacco policy. Currently, we use grade A through C uh, to be considered as a stronger tobacco policy in the DF as weak, but also in our study like analysis, we also do sensitivity analysis using A or B versus C to F. Um, and for whether there is any specific policy found to be more correlated with reduced smoking rates than others, uh, I would say um, it looks like uh, smoking-free outdoor air and smoking-free housing might play uh, larger roles compared to the others. Yeah, but um, we are still in the, like finalizing our analysis. So I cannot give you the, like the final conclusion for this now. Thank you. Was there anything else that anyone wanted to add? It looked like it for a second, but. I can continue on. Okay. Sorry if I missed this, but was this a cross-sectional study? If so, which years of data were used? Uh, we used the CHESS data from 2014 to 2019. And yes, it is cross-sectional. Thank you. But just, sorry, but just to say though that the counties, the over time that you do see trends, you know, over time uh, with space, but it is cross sectional. The individuals are, um, it's not a panel, uh, it is cross sectional in Thank you. In the interviews, did people living in areas with lower grades want more tobacco control policies? In, in the interviews, we interviewed representatives from community members, as well as um, the uh, organizations that serve those populations. And it varied across the board in terms of uh, all of them want protection for their family. Many of them have family members who have uh, tobacco related uh, health conditions. And so there, it varied across the board depending on what their particular situation was. But general, generally, we felt there was support for policies, although some of the barriers were seen as uh, significant uh, to, uh, to their moving forward and advocating and having influence to have policies adopted. Evie, did, uh, in terms of your uh, work on the with the interviews, what's your perception in terms of uh, variation across uh, the geographic areas uh, in terms of wanting more or less policies? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Toy. And I apologize, my video doesn't seem to be working. Um, but um, given our experience with the focus groups and key informant interviews, um, there was a lot of support for it. Uh, a lot of support for local policy. Um, there was uh, a lot of voiced um, uh, knowledge of uh, policies that were uh, being enacted in, in, in their communities and around the state. Um, but there was this different things that, that um, were in the way, as, as they put it. Uh, and in most cases, it was those competing interests in the community and the lack of support from the uh, elected officials. Okay. And, and that was uh, pretty much statewide. That, that was what we were uh, hearing. Thanks, Abby. 
Thank you. Continuing with questions on the on the interviews, did those in, in the interviews discuss more effective ways of enforcement since they found it inconsistent? Enforcement is usually the main issue that pops up for uh, this person in, in their work. Enforcement is one of the most challenging issue facing a tobacco policy. One is that it varies across jurisdiction. Many of these communities live in cities where the city themselves have a low level of funding for enforcement. Many of them have adopted policies. They may, some communities, uh, for instance, San Francisco and the Bay Area uh, have very strong um, uh, policies as uh, uh, you had mentioned earlier, uh, but in some communities where there's a low, uh, I'm sorry, a high percentage of the population are uh, low socioeconomic status, uh, those uh, don't have the administration uh, to enforce policies if they're on the books uh, and uh, very little monitoring and uh, enforcement. And this is an area that many organizations uh, are, are working on, particularly those that are working on public health policy law uh, in the area of tobacco control. And um, with uh, uh, communities being more active, there may be some resolutions. And if there are penalties that are attached, uh, those who suffer the most are those who are, ha are have high rates of tobacco-related illness, persistent use, and are unprotected. So this is an area of, of great concern right now. Thank you, Peggy. Is it possible that rather than the policies causing reduced tobacco use rates, that areas with reduced rates are more likely to have stronger policies, that the causation goes in the opposite direction? Yeah, I think that that's possible, but I think you 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 as our epidemiologist here that can look at the <laughs> talk about the um, that there could be a, a bias um, on which direction. So go ahead. Yeah, I would also say yes. The reverse causation might be possible, but like actually, in our analysis we already take into account like one year lag of the policy. So I um, I would just say it is possible, but we already tried to control it. Thank you. I'm wondering if anyone could comment on the role of grant funding in these policy disparities. I'm wondering if funding from Prop 99 and Prop 56 may be more prevalent in higher population areas that already have lower tobacco use rates and thus be contributing to disparities. The, uh, the grants that are made possible by Prop 99, which was not consistent uh, over time, uh, until we come to Prop 56, 56, the most recent proposition in which there was a major investment. The California voters uh, voted in the majority to pass a Proposition 56 to ensure that funding was made available uh, in uh, California uh, communities uh, and particularly in priority population areas, which is one uh, project that's underway right now to ensure that uh, the uh, racial and ethnic populations that um, are highly affected by tobacco use and exposure, uh, as well as those in low uh, socioeconomic status neighborhoods. The, the, the issue is that uh, in spite of the wide investment, there has been a great mobilization throughout California. Many of you might have remembered just recently uh, the flavor ban that was passed in Sacramento. Uh, which uh, mobilized everyone throughout California and many jurisdictions to pass flavor bans, that is the sale of tobacco products like menthol or flavored tobacco products um, and uh, electronic cigarettes. Uh, as, the, as the effectiveness of the program has been in place, uh, we're looking at the next uh, phase of funding and the, the uh, effort to ensure that it's highly um, uh, highly focused and targeted to communities where there has there's, there has been the most challenging, which persists among priority populations and in rural areas. And so we are coming to the next phase 
of the initiatives, uh, this is the priority population initiative uh, that comes to mind most recently uh, that is moving into their next phase. And so we'll see uh, whether or not continued funding will produce the, the, the um, desired objective, which is uh, to completely end the use of tobacco products in California. Thank you. Were these smoking rates adjusted by the demographical composition in these policy areas? It's back to you, you. <laughs> so for the compoundings and the effect modification that we can state in the study, like we included uh, um, generate uh, demographic information, including age, gender, like race, ethnicity, um, poverty level, education, and uh, uh, occupation, as uh, also we uh, take into account the uh, insurance coverage. Um, uh, yeah, inter uh, like all the participants interview years, uh, uh, and uh, their living cities, and uh, yeah, kinds of all of them. Thank you. You mentioned the um, con confounding and effect modification. Yes. Um, can you talk more about that? Somebody says it seems like higher socioeconomic status communities would have stronger policy and lower tobacco use prevalence. Mm, this, I, I would say probably yes, but like I need a double check. So I cannot confirm at this moment. Sounds good. And if the person wants to reach out to us directly, you can email um, us. If you email healthpolicy at ucla.edu, uh, we will refer you to Dr. Yu Yu and the team um, for any questions. Um, so we have one last um, question. Are there plans for this research to continue or be expanded to other states? New York, for example, has the highest proportion of multi-unit housing in the country. Mm. <clears throat> well, if I could say that, uh, you, you and Dr. Ponce, um, please chime in. You know, one of the things about the research from, from the center, uh, while it is uh, focused in California, we do find that people throughout the country uh, access uh, our reports and our findings and our publications. And we're hoping that this will um, be white. It, it is posted, uh, it is widely available. We participate in national forums on uh, tobacco control. This is an area of interest that I've been involved in uh, and having worked with the Public Health Law Center and other organizations uh, that work uh, nationwide as well as international on tobacco control policy issues. And I, I, I find, I think this is gonna be a significant finding to see this correlation between uh, tobacco policy and health outcomes. So we really encourage those of you who are, have colleagues nationwide to share the uh, publication with others, uh, as well as some of the supplemental material that's available on the publication website. Thank you so much, Peggy. That was um, well said, Peggy, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Uh, all right. It seems those are all the questions that we have for today. I just want to thank everyone again for joining us um, for this important event and a special thank you to Dr. Yingying Ming, who wasn't able to attend today. Uh, but thank you so much for the important research. Um, and thanks to all again for joining us. We'll see you at the next one. Have a good day.